James Bond is dead. Oh no, wait, he flies through the fireball unscathed. Hello, my name is Vincent Aiello. I am a retired United States Navy fighter pilot. Spent about 25 years in service flying mainly the F-A-18 Hornet and Super Hornet. Also had a chance to fly the F-16 Fighting Falcon or Viper. Had a tour as a Top Gun instructor and we are going to take a look at flying scenes from 10 popular movies. In our first scene here, Harry Connick Jr. turned fighter pilot is struggling with his mask. The masks that we wear are very constricting. Now granted, they're providing 100% oxygen at positive pressure, which is great, but they're still on your face and they're constricting and you can get a little claustrophobic. Of course, once you've flown a while, you get used to them. But if you begin hyperventilating, you might feel like you just need to release some of that pressure. And I believe that's what's happening here. They might have taken some liberties with the maneuverability of the F-18 down low uh, and how difficult that can be when you don't know exactly what the canyon does, whether it just turns and stops or it turns 40 degrees, 90 degrees. This is not a display that we have in the F-18, the uh, reserve fuel, which we don't have. When you get to zero, you're done. We don't have drogue chutes on the F-18 to slow it down like a B-52 or an F-5, but it's compelling to jettison the drogue chute into the face of the attacking alien with your almost out of fuel aircraft, you eject, and then ideally you're gonna go high enough to not hit the wall yourself. <laughs> he just crumbles into this big puddle of man. You survive the ejection only to uh, break your back on landing. In Flight school, every aviator is taught a PLF, a parachute landing fall. You wanna land on your feet with a little bit of a side and then go to your ankles, your calves, your hip, your, uh, your side, and your shoulders. And you wanna kinda of roll it out almost like maybe what uh, a karate maneuver would be if you were thrown. My guess is they took an actual parachute and probably a 200 pound dummy and had him fall in here, which is why he's just kinda of hanging there limp like a scarecrow. Fun movie, but I'm gonna give it a three out of 10. Ice is right below us, he's got a MIG on his tail. He's firing, brake left, brake left! Now the names that characters in aviation movies call each other, actually those are real. Those are called call signs, they're basically a fancy name for nicknames. Besides being fun and funny, these call signs or nicknames, they're actually really useful. Um, they depersonalize the situation and they remove rank. You got a MIG on your left, on your left, three o'clock! Talking about every little thing you're doing, it's just gonna clobber the radios. It's gonna make it very difficult for someone to say the things that are important that need to be said, i.e. I'm defensive or Fox 3 if you're taking an active missile shot, Fox 2 for an infrared shot. Maverick's re-engaging, sir. Now you see Maverick decide to go ahead and get back in the fight and the controller on the ship instantly recognizes that just because he happens to turn left a few degrees. The radar, the air search radar on the Nimitz class carriers is the AN SPS 48. It's an air search radar, has about a 200 mile range and at its highest rotation rate has about 15 revolutions per minute or one every four seconds. Well, at that range, with that update rate, there's no possible way this controller understands that Maverick is suddenly back in the fight just because he happens to roll left a few degrees and maneuver back. Break left, break left! I got control. Now the quote unquote MiG-28 in the scene is played by an F-5, a couple F-5s, one is a two-seater. Now the F-5 Freedom Fighter, better known as the Tiger II, in real life has twin barrel cannon mounted on the front of the nose, not a Gatling gun style as depicted. And it might make a little bit more of that standard machine gun style sound, but in reality, for what they depicted, that Gatling gun is gonna come out with a much higher rate of fire. I've never seen an aircraft, even Russian aircraft, that are controlled with the left hand. I got him, Matt. One MiG passing between us. There's a couple editing mistakes. So, example, you hear Iceman say, he's passing between us, uh, and it's the MiG-28 that passes between us. And then you see from 
Maverick's point of view, two aircraft with one go down the middle while the other aircraft is another MiG-28 or F-5. And so that didn't really make sense. You got a big on your left, on your left, three o'clock. Slider in the back seat saying, check, check the guys at the left three o'clock. Well, he's looking out the right side. And in fact, right three o'clock would have been uh, the right thing to say there. Stale, I'm on his tail, I'm going for it. Ice is shot, I'm on his tail, and then the very next clip is the F-5 chasing the F-14, where you can clearly see it's the F-5 that's behind the F-14 and not vice versa. So overall, Top Gun, of course, is a fan favorite. I've enjoyed it since I was a young man, and I'll have to give this scene, well, let's call it a seven out of 10. I love that they brought in the F-35B, relatively new when they filmed this. But my question is, if you had high power rifle and almost unlimited rounds, and you could employ against someone you're trying to take care of from even 50 feet, 100 feet, why would you go up and get in a phone booth with them where now the gun is unwieldy and, and he can turn around you and, and stick you in the back with a knife? You've got the advantage. He could have gone about a half a mile away and seen the entire scene in his heads up display. You know, we see examples of people trying to hold on to aircraft. I've never tried this. Now, I do know from walking around on top of the F-A-18 Hornet on occasion that the surfaces, well, they're smooth. And there are various nooks and crannies and openings that someone could get a handhold, a lot like a rock climber on a wall. But add to that the acceleration of moving aircraft, and the momentum and the wind and all that, this would be a pretty difficult task. I'm gonna give you a one out of 10 for this scene. And you can deal with me, Doug Masters. Watch it, son. Hey, nice shot, Colonel. Anything else you wanna send over? Way to fly, Doug. That Hollywood thinks a simple aileron roll is going to defend your aircraft from almost anything that's happening. Somebody pursuing you, a shot at you. If you just do a quick aileron roll, you're fine. Yeah, not so much. Time to die, Aaron Eagle. I don't understand why they can't get the gun sounds correct. I mean, I guess we're all conditioned to hear the individual bullets sounding, but in fact, with a high rate of fire like the M61 cannon and the F-14, it fires 6,000 rounds a minute. That's 100 rounds a second. You don't hear individual bullets. You just hear that zzz sound. Do it. When an aircraft is directly at your six o'clock, there's almost nothing harder for the defender in this case, because no matter what you do, theoretically, the other aircraft can follow you. I mean, as long as the performance is not grossly worse in the attacking aircraft. And yet we have this scene where dad, being the good dad that he is, just some happy talk. Come on, Doug, you can do it. Let's, let's take care of this guy. Let's take this guy out. And magically, the next moment, we've got Doug in the F-16 behind the bad guy. A dogfight, you're limited by physics. I mean, that's a dumb thing to say, but you are. I mean, you can't just instantaneously swap positions traveling 200 to 400 miles per hour you can't just suddenly trade spots, hit the brakes and it'll fly right by. So long, Heads up asshole. displays, it actually is real F-16 HUD symbology. We don't have to go through all of it, but you can see airspeed and altitude. Uh, you can see heading, you can see G. The one thing they mix up though, is towards the bottom off to the left, you see the letters S-I-M, that's SIM. That means you're in a simulated war mode. That's what we used to do in training. I'm gonna give it a three out of 10 though for this particular scene. How far away are they? The F-15s love to fly in what's called an eagle wall. They might have as many as 12 eagles in this wall, but what they won't be is right next to each other as you see depicted. They might be a mile up to two miles apart off each other's altitude because that way they can't uh, be so easily targeted. Then you see the afterburners stage in and of course Hollywood loves to show any fighter jet ever in afterburner. You gotta have some orange glow behind it. But the acceleration here, probably a little bit artificial. Yes, Afterburner does provide some extra thrust and it's wonderful, it's a lot of fun, but it's not gonna be like a drag car coming off the uh, green light there. When we go into combat, one of the things we do is we have what are called fence checks. You quote, fence in. And one of the things you do is you turn off your anti-collision lights 
And at night, you turn off your position lights, only leaving those night vision goggle type strip lights of green. Both the F-15s in this case and the MiG-29s are shown with their navigation lights. Coming at us, countermeasures are activated. Next you see the VC-25, which is the name of the, what we would all call a 747. Air Force One, don't forget, is just the title of that aircraft when the president is on board. The defensive systems on a VC-25 are not well publicized. Of course, why would they? They don't want opponents to know what the president's protective measures are. I assume there are some sort of expendables like chaff and flares. Why not just fire a bunch more missiles or why not just sit back there and fire the gun? Instead, the next thing we see is this slashing attack over the right wing where, oh, lucky him, it hit the number four engine. Here's the crazy part. Okay, you've got this lieutenant colonel sitting right next to you. If that's a first officer at my airline, I'm a first officer. I'm fully qualified to fly that airplane. I'm not gonna sit there and wonder where the firelight is or have somebody on the ground tell me we need to trim out the aircraft because with the rudder trim here, this guy should be able to say, hey president, I got this, sir. The F-15s firing what I presume would be AMRAMs, that's the AIM-120 air-to-air missile. They call FOX-3, which is the right terminology. Uh, the rules of engagement, clearly we are in a self-defense situation. Lots of mm, exaggerations and liberties taken, shall we say, from the point of view of military aviation. We're gonna give this one a four out of 10. I've not tried this, but I'm pretty sure air breathing jet aircraft don't fly too well through massive fireballs. Plus, we're always dripping hydraulics or fluids of some sort that are usually flammable. So not something you wanna do. Of course, note to self, if you ever knock out the back seater, make sure you spend the time to get him out of your back seat. He's kind of shaking from the recoil. And I just, I don't, I've never flown an L-39 uh, with gun pods. I can't imagine though, that you're gonna feel the recoil like a machine gunner would and he's flying with his knees. Now, I actually did this quite often in the F-18. The F-18 has a center stick, and it's conveniently located right between your knees. Uh, the F-16, on the other hand, has a side stick. Now, in the F-18, if I were busy with both of my hands, I never had to defend from someone trying to strangle me, but if there were times when I needed to adjust my helmet, or maybe I was doing something with a throttle and I was riding something on my kneeboard, then I could, for a moment, fly the aircraft with my knees. Of course, in Hollywood, anytime you have the main character in an aircraft, you'll always be able to see his face. No masks, maybe a clear visor, uh, but you'll never have that dark visor like you're just some random bad guy. This flying scene, I'm gonna give it a two out of 10. Sorry, James Bond. They actually went out like they did on Top Gun and other movies and filmed real flying scenes on a real aircraft carrier, in this case the USS Nimitz. You have real F-14s, you have real ordnance, you have real deck personnel, they're not going to bother with actors. The AIM-54 Phoenix that they depict there, now the yellow band is a way to know for a live warhead, and that's why it's on the forward part, and a brown band tells you it's a live rocket motor. So when you see yellow and brown on that white missile, which the white doesn't really matter, you know that's a real Warshot AIM-54. Now, if it was white but with blue stripes, blue means inert, or if the whole weapon happened to be blue, then you would know that that was an inert weapon as well. Here we have the F-14 pilot getting what might only be considered a real kill. Frankly, a zero is probably traveling about 120 miles an hour, maybe. F-14 looks like it's doing about 300. That's gonna be a tough shot, frankly, uh, for the F-14 pilot. But given the correct position and getting slow enough, then that could be uh, very easily done.
Here you have a red shirt that's dealing with the arresting wire. Usually that's a green shirt. I'm not sure why they used a red shirt there. Maybe it was someone under training, but normally the different shirts on the flight deck are important because that way when you can't hear, you can still tell what someone's job is. So red is ordnance, green is catapult and arresting gear as well as squadron maintenance. Uh, blue are the chalk and chain handlers. White is safety and LSOs. Brown is plane captains. Yellow are aircraft directors. You've got all these different colors. I'm gonna give this scene an eight out of 10, just docking a couple points. He's gonna fly away pretty quickly. I mean, the BD-5J microjet's got a top speed of about 320 miles per hour. This whole notion of missiles that can fly next to you and continue to pursue you until they kill you. Now, in real life, a surface-to-air missile such as this is gonna go up to maybe close to 2,000 miles per hour. It's going to be able to go after it and it's either gonna hit it or get close enough to proximity, detonate, and take it out but what it's not gonna do is come over here and say, oh yeah, well I'm gonna get you and just keep following you around and if it does miss, get mad and come back. And the whole idea that we have these angry missiles that can follow us in this movie and others, it just always struck me as funny because in order to do that, it would have to fly at roughly the same speed. Just because an aircraft and any aircraft is diving doesn't mean it's going to sound like a World War II era Stuka dive bomber. Guess what? They put particular sirens on those aircraft that were wind driven and at a certain speed they did wind up like that. And yes, we all associate that with death from the skies. Now the fuel light here, actually I love this because the Microjet only carries 30 gallons of fuel. Still love the scene, so I'm going to give this opening scene of Octopussy a four out of 10. Broken arrow is a term used for a nuclear weapon that has been compromised. Maybe it's either been lost or dropped inadvertently or something else. Apparently it does mean we are either being overrun or in threat of being overrun. But the idea is that it calls up everybody. It's like calling 911. As he's talking, it depicts them coming in and attacking. There is some coordination that exists because the whole idea of close air support is that you are in close coordination with the folks on the ground. You are dropping right next to them. And in fact, as we see in this scene, sometimes it can happen that it's too close. What you're seeing here is napalm. It's non-discriminating, as most weapons are, but if dropped in the wrong place, it's gonna burn up anything. And the one thing they didn't quite get right here is a Mark 77 or napalm canister is deliberately not equipped with fins because what fins do is put a spin on a weapon to make it more accurate for the same reason a quarterback puts a spin on a football when he throws it. I feel like they're showing the releasing aircraft just a little too low. It shows fighters going both directions. That might be a little bit of an exaggeration. Generally, you don't want that because they could employ against each other by accident. I'm gonna give it a nine out of 10. Just loses a few points for the reasons we talked about. Zero one to Italia, three trucks. He's pound on the bridge. Roger, land zero one. You're prepared to engage. Ringo's padlock in hot with guns. What bothers me though about this scene is this expectation almost in Hollywood that they can feed the audience that somewhere in America, even off the coast of Key West as depicted in the scene, are fully armed aircraft just flying around doing maneuvers. In reality, particularly since 9-11, we do have aircraft that are armed on alert at various bases, usually on the coasts, and that is for Noble Eagle, and that is in case we have another 9-11, but for training. I mean, it looks to me like it's really Harriers flying by this uh, helicopter. Recommend using your Mavericks to take out the bridge. Roger that. Line flight switch Mavericks. Two. Two. Okay. Uh, you know, n normally you do want to acknowledge a call that's made, but they just felt very scripted. You see the Harriers peel off right away, presuming they're the ones designating the target. They just need to make sure that the laser is continuously on the bridge the entire time. And then when it hits, yeah, I mean, these could be miniatures they're blowing up. It looks fairly realistic. The Maverick AGM-65 was designed to go after tanks. So it's got pretty good punch and it's going for armored targets. So against cement, yeah, it might do pretty well. 
course, the hair keeps flying later. You've got uh, Dana, uh, the daughter of the hero here, and some more gunfire and aim nine shots. Really love the scene. Overall, I'm going to give it a 6 out of 10 for True Lies.